It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the implacable John Hersey and the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably John Hersey. How are you doing this morning, John? I'm great. I'm I'm rocking and ready to talk about one of my favorite heroes of history, Thomas Jefferson. How are you doing today, Andy? Yeah, I'm I'm ready to rock and roll too. You know, Jefferson is is an immortal, and of course, in honoring him as you know we we properly do, we're also telling cancel culture that they can go pound sand because <laughs> you you know Jefferson's well a, uh, yeah Jefferson is a towering hero and uh, is flawed without a doubt. I will discuss that. That in fact, we discussed it in in part one when the as a slave owner, but uh, his his accomplishments in the battle for individual rights simply cannot be overlooked. They have to be honored. And in fact, uh, warrants two episodes, right? Two parts to the Thomas Jefferson show. So we gonna yeah, get to Yeah, if you're the, just uh, tuning in on, yeah, on this one, we, we did Jefferson last week as well, and we talked about his early life. Uh, we hit some of the highlights of his career, but we didn't get to go into any great depth on some of those. So that's what we hope to take up today. Yeah. Right, because Jefferson was so multifaceted, you know, in in his career, uh, you know, he was an, he was an architect and a writer. His 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 book, the Notes on the State of Virginia, is often considered the most important book that was published in the country prior to eighteen hundred. You know, he's he's a uh, he, was, he was a musician. I mean, he was a horticulturalist. He was so many things, but we need to discuss his political career: Secretary of State, Vice President. And of course, a two-term U.S. president. The ups and the downs in politics, but there were a lot of good things in Jefferson's political career, aren't there? Absolutely. You mentioned notes on the state of Virginia that came out while he was uh, while he was minister to France. And uh, at first, he really didn't want this book to get out. He he just had some some you know modest two hundred copies uh, printed to so he could distribute among friends. Uh, when John Adams saw it, he said that it was the the sections on slavery were worth diamonds. That it was uh, going to be more effective in abolishing slavery than any treatise written by a philosopher could ever be hoped to be. So, um, yeah. So, you know, I think we touched on his time in France previously, and that was largely a disappointment to Jefferson. He didn't get a lot done while he was over there. But he gained a great perspective on foreign affairs that he would then take into his uh, first position in, under Washington as Secretary of State. Right, right, and and we should say, uh, yeah, n- notes on the state of Virginia. The the it's fascinating that he was such an effective abolitionist in theory while being a slave owner all of all of his life. So you know we could we give him we give him kudos. His recognition that the slavery, you know, the evils of slavery. So, especially he was born in the 1740s. He was born into a world in which slavery had existed forever, and you know, the principle of individual rights just being born. John Locke, for example, who we did a hero show episode on, uh, the principle of individual rights, which is eventually what's end slavery, at least in parts of the world, in, including the United States, was just being born in Jefferson's lifetime. So, you know, we can understand that. But still, he was such a strong individualist himself that uh, his his continued um, his continued commit, commitment in practice to the hideous institution of slavery, we, we, we condemned him for last time. But also the, the notes on the state of Virginia, John, is, is, is often recognized as a masterpiece in, in, in geography. And Jefferson, if I remember my history correctly, Jefferson was the first meteorologist amongst his other accomplishments. He was the leading meteorologist in the country uh, in, during, during his lifetime. And his, his, his notes, his, his, his book contains uh, a lot of information on, on that as, as well. So, yeah, he's a multi-talented uh, individual. Should, should we pick up with uh, his Secretary of State position under Wa- President Washington? Sounds good. Yeah. So he faced a, a couple different crises during this period. First, and and one of the most important was the assumption of the war debts by the federal government. Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, had come up with a plan by which 
the federal government would assume the, the revolutionary war debts of all the different states. And some states had paid mo much of their debt and they were very much against, against this plan that they, they should then uh, assume the debts of, of some of the other states that hadn't paid much of their war debt. Um, many of these states that had paid much of their war debt are, already were uh, in the South. The Southern states, um, a, a bit more affluent, a bit richer, and uh, they, had, they had paid much of their debt. So Hamilton is distressed. He can't get his, his plan passed for the resumption of state debts. And you know this is very, very early in, in Washington's first term, I believe 1790. And uh, the Congress is basically threatening to implode right out of the gate over this issue. Uh, they didn't want to address any other issue until this one was resolved. And so Jefferson, uh, he would later very much regret his role in this, but he met with Hamilton and uh, he decided to host a dinner with Hamilton, Madison, and a few others and offer this suggestion that uh, perhaps uh, we can get some of these Southern states to agree to the assumption of, of revolutionary war debt by agreeing to have to, to place the uh, federal capital on the Potomac, where it is today what we now know as Washington, D.C. And so this, uh, this compromise worked. It, uh, it, all parties involved were happy with it. And so that's what we got. And, and Jefferson would later look back at, at this early period of his relations with Hamilton and say that it was the thing he most regretted in his political career because it opened the door for many of Hamilton's other plans. Right. So that's, I think that... I'm sorry. One of the biggest Go things ahead, that that happened at, as Secretary of State. The other right. was sort and, of a, a uh, test run. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Finish what you say. Uh, the other crisis that that came up while he was Secretary of State uh, ended up being a, a test run and and really a uh, a practice for Jefferson uh, on his foreign policy. The Spanish. Uh, impressed some some british uh, uh took over a british ship off the coast of vancouver and there was this looming threat of war between spain and britain and of course the americans were worried well spain held, holds territories in the western uh, side of the colonies along the mississippi and they hold, held the louisiana territory and if they go to war with britain then it's very likely britain will will come and try to claim that territory from them and the last thing that we want is to be again encircled and subjugated by the British. That was Jefferson's view as Secretary of State. And of course, foreign policy was, was within his purview and his role. But Alexander Hamilton, who we've already mentioned, was Secretary of the Treasury. And um, Hamilton had a very different view, whereas Jefferson was partial to the would come in uh, on the side of the Americans. Uh, Hamilton had affinities to the British and, and met with George Beckwith, who was, it later turned out, a secret agent of the British government, and began relaying information to Beckwith, basically uh, implying that America was more conciliatory toward Britain than it really was. And so this would lay the groundwork for some very, uh, you know, very deep animosity between Jefferson and Hamilton because he is here on Jefferson's turf and opposing Jefferson's foreign policy and even Washington's, because Washington at this point was very much on the side of Jefferson that uh, we, we don't want to really extend an olive branch to either side. We want to remain neutral. And uh, if, if war breaks out, then we'll have to figure out whether or not to march into the Louisiana ter territory then. So Washington and Jefferson were, were agreed on this point, and Hamilton took it upon himself to continue these conversations with George Beckwith and to indicate that America was uh, more conciliatory toward Britain than it really was. And all of this really came to not accept as just a, a dry run for American foreign policy and uh, one of these events that really shaped the dynamic between Jefferson and Hamilton in the early presidency of Washington. Right. 
And certainly uh, the impression that that America was more conciliatory towards Britain than, than Thomas Jefferson was, because this is this of course this of course during the European wars between Britain and, and France, revolutionary France in the years before Napoleon uh, came to power, the you know the great tension and you know conflict between the French Republic and Britain, which was still a monarchy, and Jefferson sided with the French and, and the, you know, and the, and the, and the French Revolution. He hated monarchy, hated anything to do with kings and, and, and aristocracy. He was all for a Republican form of government. Even he supported the French, even during the bloodbath, you know, of, uh, of the Great Terror, preferred them over, over, the, over the British. And of course, he accused his Federalist foes of being secret monarchists, of, of supporting of supporting Britain, you know, and and the, and the king. So yeah, there was a there was a lot of there was a lot of tension, you know, o, o, over that issue. It's interesting, John, because you can understand, you know, the, the po politics is 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 dirty business, you know, and it's often very mixed. Uh, in, but you can understand either side here because France was struggling, however, bloodily towards uh, a, a republican form of government, which eventually it achieved in the 19th century, while uh, Britain, uh, although a monarchy, was, was much more civilized and peaceful than France was at this time. They weren't chopping off people's heads, you know, <laughs> uh, for the crime of being an aristocrat, including little kids. So, you, can, you know... I, if, if I was alive at that time, I think I would have sided with the British, uh, even though you know I agree with Jefferson how mo monarchy is is reprehensible over the bloodbath that the revolution was bringing about in, in, in France. Yeah, Jefferson, like many, saw hope in the early French Revolution and held on to it a bit longer than than the evidence seems to warrant he should have, but. Um, you know, even early on, he said that uh, he thought that their first step should be uh, in the convening of the Estates General to establish the power to originate laws and then to take their time and gradually reform. And he worried very, very early on that the impatience of some would lead to would lead to uh, a revolution that the French really weren't prepared for. He thought that the French were not prepared for sort of republic that uh, the, the Americans had. They weren't morally prepared for it. That, you know, the founders thought, and I think they were right in this, that a Republican form of government requires some sense of civic education, some sense of, of I, I don't want to say civic duty, because I think that that word duty is an anti-concept, but, uh, you know, a real care for civil concerns that, that people ought to be actively engaged in self-government and that in order to be actively engaged, as we'll see later with his establishment of the University of Virginia, they really need a strong foundation, a strong education in the basic principles of liberty. And so he, he didn't think that the French had that, but he did hold on to hope, uh, you know, Far longer, you know, for instance, Edmund Burke over in England almost immediately at the storming of the Bastille, I believe it was, he said that this is this is reprehensible and will only lead to bloodshed. And so there were people that were prescient in that respect. And I think Hamilton uh, was. But Hamilton also openly said that he thought that the British form of government was the best. Um, you know, one of the things that Jefferson was was peeved about when he first saw the uh, draft of the United States Constitution was the lack of term limits for the president. He thought, well, this is going to set the stage for presidents that serve for life. And obviously, Hamilton, at the at the head of this business of creating the Constitution, um, you know, he 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 didn't see any need to establish uh, term limits, and I think he would have been against that. But uh, I don't, I don't know for certain on that. That's more speculation. But yeah, there are real differences here in their opinions and. Jefferson, um, on the whole, uh, seems to be the, the, the more liberal minded, liberal in the classical liberal sense of that mm -hmm. term, whereas right. Hamilton is, is very much more about uh, establishing a strong federal, federal government, having been a soldier alongside Jefferson, or sorry, Washington, the Revolutionary War, uh, he saw the need for strong executive power. Right. 
I want, I want to make a philosophic point here that, that I think Jefferson himself would find interesting before we get back to his political career. But, you know, American conservatives will often say that the difference between the American Revolution and the French Revolution is religion. You know, that the, the, <laughs> the, American, Re, the American revolutionaries were Christians, whereas the French revolutionaries were atheists or became atheists. And, and since the Americans were Christians, they respected life. And since the French were atheists, they, they didn't. And they, 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 were, they were perpetrated all this bloodshed. And I think the presence of religion, I think they're right, but in an opposite way to their meaning. Um, uh, you know, American conservatives like Dinesh D'Souza, uh, for example, who, who I philosophically thrashed in our, uh, you know, debate on uh, Christianity. But um, the presence of religion, in part, is what made the French Revolution so bloody. You know, the, 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 the French had been so oppressed for a thousand years by the church and the aristocracy and the monarchy that there was this understandable, you know, rage that it had, 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 that had pent, been pent up for a, a millennium. And it poured out in the French Revol Revolution, and they killed, you know, the aristocracy, and they, and, and and it was it was dominated by a, a justified rage. I don't think the actions were justified, but the rage was. Whereas in the United States, there was no established religion that had oppressed the American people. There was no established aristocracy that had oppressed the American people, and so you don't see that kind of pent up rage you know, boiling over. What, what, what if Voltaire used to sign some of his letters with destroy the infamous thing, right? Meaning, meaning the church. There's no equivalent to that in, a, in a America. And, and besides the fact that many of the leading founders were very lukewarm Christians, influenced as much by deism and uh, Jefferson himself, as an example, as, a, as they were by Christianity. But I think, I think it's necessary to reverse the conservatives' argument on this. They're right. The, the role that religion plays in the contrast with the con contrast between these two religions, but it's in the reverse than than, than what they what they mean. And it would, it would be great to have Thomas Jefferson here for many reasons, uh, including to you know run him for president, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but also to discuss these kinds of philosophic issues with him once he you know caught up on the several centuries of history that uh, that have, have taken place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd love to have him on the show. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we can get a spokesperson for him at some point. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in, but, uh, in France too. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the Catholic Church predominated. And one of the things he was very concerned about when he brought his daughters over was that they find a good school where they weren't uh, imposed upon with with Catholic dogmas. Uh, but yeah, not only was it the Catholic Church that dominated there, but then. The monarch. I know that Jefferson, soon after arriving in France, he wrote, uh, paraphrasing Voltaire, he said that here everyone is either the the hammer or the anvil. It, you know, it's Correct. the oppressed right. or the oppressors. And uh, right. you know, so he felt very badly for the, for the for the people of France. And um, right, right, and and right. he exactly. tried to do what he could. Just just, just let me just let me yeah. jump in here for a second. And that's part of the res mm -hmm. rational response to the American conservatives about the the you know the hammer and, and the anvil the church was a big part of what they called the ancien regime the ancient regime that was the hammer you know b banging down on the on these poor oppressed peoples which uh, again i want to you just want to get at that point to the, to the conservatives but jefferson of course who was uh, uh, a deist very, uh, very had gone through his own personal bible and crossed out all the all the mystical references <laughs> Did any? Yeah, but, he created yeah, his he was, own version of the Bible. <laughs> yeah, it should be it should be available online. It's, you know, along with the new international version, we should have the Jeffersonian version of the Bible. It's certainly much shorter than you know than the the, the conventional Bible, since all the mystical elements are are expunged, and I mean, it should be available for people to read. But, but I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You're right. He he, as the individualist he was, he certainly empathized with the French people being oppressed for centuries by the ancient regime. Did you want to finish that point? Yeah. What did he call his? What did he call his Bible? Was it like the life of the, the life and morals of Jesus? And it was his that that Jesus, you know, that Jesus had good moral lessons, but that he was not um, not necessarily some divine being. I might be getting some of this wrong. It's been a while since I've I've brushed up on that 
part of my, my Jeff. Yeah, I'm not sure, but, but, it, but it was it was it was something like that. He certainly believed Jesus was a moral paragon. I, I certainly disagree with him uh, about that. But yeah, he deleted all the mystical elements. He's not God. He's 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 a he's a human being. Yeah. Yeah, and but, so but, uh, I mean, on our on our yeah, uh, whistle stop tour through Jefferson's political history, I guess the next thing to talk about would be uh, the debate over the, uh, the the federal bank that Hamilton had proposed. So, um, shall we go there next, or or do you want to say yeah, more on, yeah. on the French? No, no. Uh... Well, yeah. One last thing about about Jefferson siding with the with the French is again, it's it's un, it's more understandable in the context today in the twenty first century. The United States has been allied with Great Britain for a hundred years, you know, since since World War One. Whereas in seventeen nineties, they had just fought a bitter war against the British to to free themselves from from British tyranny. So it's understandable, and the French had aided the Americans in, in the War of Independence. So it's understandable why, at several levels, why Jefferson would be very, very uh, skeptical about being allied with the British, especially since the British was still, Britain was still a monarchy, and the French, at least, was, were, were, were uh, struggling desperately to try to establish some kind of Republican form of government. So it's understandable why he, he, his animosity yeah. towards the British. And, and while he was there in France, he was getting most of his information from the Marquis de Lafayette, who had, you know, of course, valiantly fought alongside Washington. And uh, Lafayette was very optimistic about the progress of liberty in France. Uh, of course, he was also proven wrong. But here is somebody, here's a, a true patriot that uh, Jefferson had tremendous respect for, asking for his help in doing such things as, as helping him draft a Declaration of Rights. Declaration of the Rights of Man that would be declared in France. And so, yeah, I think his, his um, affinities to the French are extremely understandable. And, and, you know, not long after when we were talking about Jefferson, um, actually ar around this time, Jefferson visited Adams in London. Uh, Adams was then the ambassador to England. And they got the cold shoulder. You know, the, the king would not with them. The, the man who did meet with them would not. He was speaking out of the left side of his mouth the entire time. So it was very clear to him that the, the English uh, were not going to be civil. They were not lies. And he feared the subjugation of the English. And, and of course, his fears were not unfounded as the War of 1812 would show. Right. Right. And again, uh, uh, on behalf of of the Mar Marquis de Lafayette, uh, he was right in, in the long run. It, it took till the mid to late nineteenth century, but France did establish itself as a republic, and it has been, you know, it, it, it has been ever since. Revolutions are often bloody things. There's no, uh, I'm certainly not going to support it. You know, the, the kill the killing of, of of so many innocents, including children. Uh, it made possible, though, Baroness Oxy's great novel, The Scarlet Pimpernel, right, of this story of this, this British hero who is rescuing aristocrats from the, you know, from the, from the, from Madame Guillotine. But yeah, it was bloody. Uh, it did, we, if we see the big picture, it did it, 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 in, the, in, the, in the end lead to a free society in, in France. And again, I think, the, I think the cause of that, ultimately, the underlying cause was the, the thousand years of repression by the part of the ancient regime, of which the Catholic Church was a big part. Uh, but uh, uh, Jefferson and Hamilton, yeah, I don't remember a lot of details of, of, of the bank, but well, I, know, I, know it's, I, I know it's important. But... Uh, the, 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 the contra we discussed this a little bit last week, John, and, but it, I think it merits, uh, it, I think it warrants uh, further discussion. Because these are two of the heroes, you know, of, of American history, Alexander Hamilton, who, who we, we've done an episode on, you know, for the Hero Show with our good friend, uh, Robert Begley, uh, and, and Thomas Jefferson. And they had, they had uh, just had differing, differing visions. And, and they both had, they, you know, they both had, uh, a good deal, you know, of, they both had a good deal of merit. You know, uh, Hamilton foresaw that the United States could and should become an industrial power. 
is, you know, the, the industrial revolutions underway in Britain. Hamilton admires the British uh, to start with and favors them in their conflict with, with the French. And he, he foresees the United States becoming an urban and uh, capitalist industrial power. And, and his work as Secretary of, Tre of Treasury really set the United States in, in that direction. Whereas Jefferson, of course, uh, he's seen the big cities in, in Europe, you know, they were, he, he, uh, he, you know, he, he, he saw them as, you know, dirty, you, you know, polluted, uh, you know, f cesspools of crime and that it was better to be an agrarian society and, um, um, Jefferson, of, of course, the, the great thing about Jefferson is his individualism. Every man a landowner was his vision, working for yourself. Politics is small and local. Government is severely delimited, has very little power relative to, uh, uh, what, to what Hamilton foresaw, uh, or uh, certainly relative to, to what it became. It's always the, you know, I always look at Jefferson's mistakes, his errors, his flaws, and I always, you know, think to myself, yeah. But it's overshadowed by what an individualist he was. His respect for the individual, for individual sovereignty, is this. I don't know if anybody in, in the whole history of politics, you know, was more of a of an of a individualist than Thomas Jefferson was, and that's you know that's that's the the, the reason why I salute you know him as the as as the hero as the hero that that he is. Even though you know I agree with Hamilton on 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 this issue about America becoming industrialized, capitalist, urban. Uh, power and by the way, Hamilton also saw. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Tom. The cities could be dirty and the crime and everything. That's because that's because people are productive there. They're they're creating wealth. They're making money. And cities are also centers of of culture, you know, and and industry and you know and such. You could see, you know, you could see the arguments on on both sides. Yeah, you know, when I look back at this period. Um... It's easy to, to to take sides in any of these debates and, and to say this person was right, this person was wrong. But I look back with just such gratitude uh, that America had this pool of incredible minds at this time, at this early and trying time for the United States. And that, so, you know, where some had failings, other had virtues, and they were able to, to basically form this thing together. And yeah, it, it often came through strife. But that strife led to to greatness. Now, yes, um, yeah, yeah, and, and you know, so I actually view this. I'm, I'm an editor, and uh, people will write great things, and they bring it to me, and I, and I help them uh, fix it and and um, and spin it. And I see th that there's a sort of similar symbiosis happening between the different founders here. Um, but you know, there are. There are key issues here that still are important questions for us to look at today. You know, the Constitution versus Jefferson's view of the Constitution. Uh, I, I don't know that, uh, you know, I, I think I expressed this before, but I don't know that Jefferson, uh, I, I know in his notes on the state of Virginia, which is written you know, earlier in the, in the uh, early 1780s, uh, he was very much about this yeoman farmer, but he was talking about the state of Virginia and you have to remember that while he was there in France, he was uh, he was working out treaties such that uh, he would help boost international trade. Now, he wasn't really successful. I think Frederick the, the Great was the only one that actually signed one of these treaties. But he was there on behalf of boosting American commercial interest. And uh, when he came back, this this deal about the bank, um, you know, Hamilton believed that, uh, and I think it's important actually to lay out how this, this came about. Uh, Hamilton thought that the, that the bank was necessary for, um, for, for basically paying off and managing the government's debts. And when Jefferson looked at the constitution, uh, in particular, early on, he was, he was flustered. He was, he was uh, aggravated that the original draft he got didn't have a bill of rights. And so he was instrumental in getting Madison to uh, to concoct one that eventually got ratified, but the Tenth Amendment had yet to be ratified. But that that was um, foreseen as, as becoming part of the, the Constitution. This saying that the uh, the federal government has only those power those powers enumerated to it, 
and that all others are to be left to the states or to the people. And when Jefferson looked at the Constitution, he said, well, there's nothing in the Constitution. There's no enumerated power saying that the government can create this bank. And if we look at even at the general welfare clause, it says that the government can tax people, uh, it, it can tax the states in order to provide for the common defense of the country and to promote the general welfare. And he said, look, this clause says that uh, we can tax people in order to provide for the, the general welfare or the common defense. It doesn't say we can do anything to provide for those. And it says that we must provide for those, not that we should just do anything that is convenient for the government. And if we, if we allow this interpretation, if we uh, let go of the constructionism of the, our reading of the Constitution, then we open up this boundless field of power and that the entire Constitution comes down to essentially being the government is empowered to do whatever the people will it. And uh, because those in power get to decide, then essentially those in power get to do anything they want. And so Jefferson was, was uh, I think, right on this, that the Constitution has to be interpreted strictly, cannot be interpreted loosely. And I know we're going to get right. to Louisiana Purchase uh, even right. later right. With, with, with the, right. the, the with Jefferson doesn't, Louisiana Purchase. Doesn't, you know, doesn't put his own principles mm -hmm. into practice, but 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 he certainly strengthened the, the country. I'm, I'm sorry, go, go yeah. ahead. You finish your thought. Well, with that, though, with the Louisiana Purchase, he never tried to justify, he never tried to give a loose interpretation of the Constitution. He just said that the Constitution doesn't actually allow for this, but it's the will of the people, and we're going to have to figure that out afterward. So maybe we'll come up with an amendment later. And he, he, vied, he, he fought for getting an amendment to the Constitution such that the federal government would be granted the power of, of buying more territory. Uh, but that, ne that never came to play. That never happened right. in his lifetime. Right. Right. Now, before we move on to the briefly to the vice presidency and then, you know, spend the time on 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 his presidency. One thing about the secretary of state years, which that was what, 1790 to 1793, because he was secretary of state in Washington's first uh, administration. You made the good point last week, John, and I think we could elaborate on it, how even if Jefferson was not as uh, sanguine about America's future as an industrial power, as, as Hamilton, it was his commitment to individual rights that made all of, that made all of this this possible. You know, in the late uh, post Civil War, post Thirteenth Amendment, the uh, you know it's, it's fascinating how ideas uh, and principles redound. You know, into into the future long after their founders are gone. But uh, post eighteen sixty five. Uh, 13th Amendment ended in slavery, you know, the late 19th century America, which historians refer to as the Gilded Age and in the Capitalist Manifesto, I, you know, I call the the inventive period. Well, what makes all of that possible? You know, Edison and the light bulb and the Wright brothers and the aviation and Bell and the telephone, this outpouring of advances and any, any fields you want to you wanna mention is the principle of individual rights. And you, meant, you made the point last week that Jefferson's principles, on Jefferson's principles, people who wanted to found industries, uh, you know, and, and create technologies and everything were, were free to do so. So it, Jefferson has the, uh, nobody is, is more committed to individual rights than Thomas Jefferson. And, he, and, and it's that principle that made all that possible. And I think we should, I think we, you know, should get, get, we pay, pay, pay homage uh, that's due to the great man on this. Uh, the vice presidency under John Adams the, uh, shows uh, some of Jefferson's negative qualities, doesn't it? And uh, I should we should, <laughs> I should read something. So I used. See, I, see, I just happened to have a copy of there my it is. book, Heroes, Heroes, Legends, That's Champions, with that beautiful Brian Lawson uh, the, the image on the on the cover. But I used you know the, as a chapter on morally flawed heroes, as as you know, John, since. Uh, uh, we had that we had that great uh, discussion in the Objective Standard on on heroes and and the hero book, book last year, but Jefferson was morally flawed not just uh, regarding slavery and we should you know in, in justice here we should say something about this so I said, let me let me read let me read briefly uh, here on the negative side 
He was a prime player in the vicious political party wars of the 1790s, deliberately spreading demonstrably false rumors about upright men among his Federalist foes. He claimed, for example, that President Washington was in effect senile, and several years later that President Adams sought war with France. While vice president, he hired a scandal monger to write a venomous screed against the president, his longtime friend and revolutionary ally, John Adams. He perpetrated such calumnies while vigorously denying culpability, conducting, in the vivid phrase of historian Joseph Ellis, quote, an artful minuet with duplicity, unquote. That's, that's from Joseph Ellis' uh, founding brothers. Which is, a, which is a book that I, you know, I certainly recommend. Ellis has a way with words, doesn't he? An artful minuet with duplicity. Yes, <laughs> but it, so uh, uh, and and of course, this uh, this caused George Washington, of course, to break eventually to break all relations with with Thomas Jefferson, who he had so admired Jefferson's talents and you know and and Jefferson's genius, but. The, the dishonesty here, we know, we know George Washington was a morally upright man. He, yeah, and he, in the end, he, he felt compelled to break, all, break off all relations with Jefferson, said. Yeah, these early days of, of American politics were vicious. Um, one thing to note about Jefferson was that his personality was, he was very sort of timid. He was not a public speaker by any means that, you know, when, when he gave his, uh, inaugural address the first time people complained they could barely hear him he he absolutely hated comedy, but he had very strong ideas about government and how things ought to be done and so how to how to uh conduct oneself in this arena uh there weren't really any other examples at this point how you know um government of by and for the people uh, a political system that is totally based upon popular vote. Uh, how how to uh, get one's point across? And Jefferson definitely did not take the honorable route here. Um, right. You know, he hired Philip Freneau and and actually paid him um, from government coffers to to write these screeds against the Federalists. And uh, that's that's definitely uh, you know th these are moral failings of Jefferson. Uh, I think it's also important to keep in mind that Jefferson uh, did not want to go and print himself and and say these things, and and so this is not uh, an excuse or or um, or anything on his part. But um, you know, he was in a, in a tough position, and I think the right thing to have done would be to express himself plainly in in the papers. Um, yeah, you know, to, and, to he state was, his and he own was and he was vice clearly. president. And he was vice president. Uh, you know, he wasn't outside the administration. He was vice president yeah. to, to John Adams. And yeah, and making matters worse, this was his, you know, uh, regarding personal morality, this was his longtime friend and revolutionary ally, you know, John Adams. We had we you know, we showed mm -hmm. that great painting last week about the writing of the the Declaration, where Adams and Franklin, uh, you know, uh, are there, and, and Jefferson, Jefferson standing. It's, it's uh, Adams is in the painting. Adams is is the one reading the Declaration, right? Not or was it Franklin? I don't, I don't, I don't remember one of them. Adams but, is there contemplating something. He's got oh, deep okay. thought of his and, own. And Franklin, and Franklin Franklin's the reader there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Je but anyhow, it's a great painting, and uh, even though it's not historically accurate, it's historically accurate in the sense that Jefferson and Adams were were very close uh, for for a long time, and became close again, which we 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 should we you know in their correspondence, which which we'll mention. But he stabbed in, he stabbed in the his, his one the president he when he's the vice president, and two his friend John Adams in the back, and one of those calumnies about you know Adams desiring war with France is yeah it's just a, it's just an outright lie. And uh, during the XYZ affair, and to do to do justice to John Adams, uh, and Adams f of eventually made that correspondence public. Uh, you know that the French, the Talleyrand, that 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 urbane snake of a you know of of a French minister who had the order, had all the etiquette of a gentleman, but he had the soul of a you know of a 
a blackguard. Talleyrand's agents demanded a bribe to conduct, you know, negotiations, and the Americans refused. Adams didn't make that public because he knew that the public sentiment would be so strong that it might lead to war with, with France, which he wanted to avoid. Adams did not want to go to war with France. And eventually he, he made it public. And, you know, and, and Jefferson and, and, his, and Adams both said, oops, <laughs> you know, we, we, mis, we misinterpreted this entirely. Adams is trying to avoid war with France, whereas, whereas Jefferson was claiming he was trying to incite war with France. So yeah, it's an artful minuet with duplicity. Joseph Ellis is is right about that. Uh, so we have to acknowledge the moral flaws here. You know, the two major moral flaws, of course, the, the hypocritical uh, involvement in, in, in uh, being a slave owner when he's a uh, in principle, he's an abolitionist. And of course, there's backstabbing political, dirty political infighting. Uh, but his achievements tower over this, should we should we should we move on to his his two term presidency, John? Yeah, yeah, and, and his vice presidency. By the way, this was at a time when the person who got the second most votes became vice president. So it was very clear that you know this is not what we have today, where a president has a running mate and the, the two are uh, in cahoots and and agree with each other on policies. This was an open. Uh, open war from the get-go between different views of government, the Federalist view of a strong federal government and the Democratic-Republican view that Jefferson stood for uh, with a, a federal government strong enough to, to take care of defense and foreign affairs, but to leave the states to their own business and to let them uh, pass their own laws and regulate themselves. So, yeah, and an, um, impassioned, I think that's and an impassioned defense. I always want to stand up for Jefferson here because I've been criticizing him. And an impassioned defense of individual rights. You're limiting the power of the government and, and just absolutely standing up for individual sovereignty on, you know, it, on so many issues. There's, there's where Jefferson's political greatness lies. So I criticize him, but I always got to praise him for his, his, uh, his individualism. The, the, the election... Uh, when when uh to jefferson's first first term where he and burr were tied right and it went to congress and it went to like 36 ballots and it's interesting because alexander hamilton despite having uh, the strong philosophical disagreements with jefferson of which we've spoken convinced some of his federalist allies in congress to vote for jefferson rather than burr because although he disagreed uh, on many philosophical issues about the, the proper role of government with Jefferson. Uh, he, Burr was a scoundrel. He just, he thought Burr was a blackguard and he didn't want, he didn't, and Hamilton didn't want Burr anywhere near the presidency. And so Hamilton's influence helped tip the vote for, for Jefferson. Thank God. You know, thank God for that, right? Yeah. And, and Burr would, you know, Burr agreed to run as essentially Jefferson's running mate and then stabbed him in the back and vied for getting himself elected as president. So this is just further confirmation of Hamilton's evaluation of Burr's character. And of course, as we know, Burr would then later, uh, this was one of the reasons Burr would have this personal dispute with Hamilton and later and later kill him in a duel. Right. Um, right. So yeah, Burr, yeah. Burr was enormously talented. There's no doubt Burr was enormously talented, but, but, uh, was unscrupulous. It's, it's, it sounds like he was a thoroughly unscrupulous character. That that you know that that he was a villain. Although Jefferson, as we discussed, you know, morally had his flaws. Still, Jefferson was principled in support of individual rights, and I think Hamilton uh, Hamilton Hamilton knew that, and uh, yeah, therefore cast you know used his influence to get Jefferson elected, which is a great yeah, of thing. the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead I John. think Hamilton saw that, that of the two, there was no comparison. Jefferson was a statesman. He had principles and he disagreed with Hamilton on many of those principles, but he had them and he would stick to them. Burr was a pragmatist, uh, unprincipled, uh, basically vying for power, the exact sort of thing that the founders saw as a threat to this country. They understood that, yes, we can construct this in tremendous uh, government checks and balances and we can do our best to that uh, we have full leadership but at the end of the day we require upright individuals this nation requires upright people 
moral exemplars to be in office. And, you know, their, their foresight on this, I think, has, has uh, really shown through in, in the recent, you know, just over the last century, if you look at America and look at the, the sorts of people that have been in office and the direction that this country is, is wrong about this, you can design a great government and do everything in your power to, to ensure that you've got these checks and balances in place. But ultimately, you need moral actors. And, and so Hamilton thought Jefferson uh, the better, the, the better prepared for the job of the two and threw his weight into getting Jefferson elected. Right. And Hamilton was certainly so, right on this. And Je Jefferson, as president, did a, you know, you put it nicely, John, that Hamilton saw that Jefferson had principles and would, would stick to them. And one of the, you know, in, in, in his presidency, his two-term presidency, there were several important instances of, of that. I was, when I was doing some research for this issue the other day, I was, I was interested to note that Jefferson closed what he considered uh, several or, or a number of unnecessary government offices and cut useless establishments and expenses, shrank the Navy uh, for a while anyway, before the Barbary Wars, uh, to st and simply used a fleet of inexpensive gunboats that were used on only for defense. And, and after his two terms were over, uh, by cutting government expenses, he had, or at least it, 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 it was part, it was part of the way to uh, diminish the national debt from 83 million to 57 million dollars, which was a lot of money back then. But Def Jefferson's principles, of course, you know, that government governs le uh, best, which governs least. Wasn't that, wasn't that a Jeffersonian quote? Uh, I think that's Jefferson, but if it's yeah, not Jefferson. It's, yeah, his first. Yeah, that his government. first inaugural is where he's best. Been, yeah. That government governs best, which governs least, and of course he cut, he cut out various offices and say you know and spent less money, less money that had to be stolen from the taxpayers, and so you you know we see Jefferson's commitment to principle and you know in that in that issue and you know and, and several others that that we'll discuss. Yeah, yeah, I think you know we discussed the the Barbary <laughs> Wars a bit last week, so I don't know if we want to take that up again or sh shall we? move on to uh, Louisiana Purchase. Yeah, I think we should move to Louisiana Purchase. But first, I think we should also mention that it was it was Jefferson who was responsible for founding the United States Military Academy at, at West Point. And uh, you know, he I don't remember the name of the name of the act, but Je but you know, but Jefferson supported it strongly. Um, and uh, again, the purpose of government uh, you know, uh, for an individualist like Jefferson is to defend the rights of you know, of honest citizens that defend individual rights and to have a, uh, to have a, a military uh, and a military leadership was, was, in, was important to that. And, you know, and Jefferson wanted, at, at West Point, of course, and Annapolis and the Air Force Academy, these are very good schools. And then, you know, the officers are trained in, in all kinds of uh, s uh, subjects. He wanted, he wanted American officers to be trained in various sciences so they didn't have to import far, foreigners, you know, as, as aides and, you know, and, you know, as, as, as advisors, whose people whose allegiances were, you know, could be suspect, were not necessarily loyal to the, to the United States. He wanted an officer corps who could, an American officer corps who could do that. And again, uh, Jefferson prescient on, on this issue. Excellent. Yeah. For some reason I had it in my head that Adams had established the, uh, the, the, uh, academy. that's, that's good. Well, to know. I, I, I yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I don't. I'm not an expert on the history here. I'm just a dilettante in American history. We get our buddy Brad Thompson back on the show, who's an expert on America's revolutionary period, and promised us that he was going to prove that Adams was the most important of the founders. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, you know, may, may, very possible that John Adams had laid the foundation for, for the military U.S. Military Academy at West Point. I'm not sure, but according to the research I was doing, it was Jefferson who, who put it in, who put this into action and actually, actually got it done. But um, very cool. Yeah, that is cool. Louisiana Purchase. Now this is interesting because here Jefferson, <laughs> he is not as as POTUS. He is not. You know, put it into into action. His principles are about a strict interpretation of enumerated powers in the U.S. Constitution, and yet it's something he he does because it obviously, for, for in several ways, enormously strength 
strengthens the fledgling republic. And you see his commitment to uh, Amer- you know, to the to the building and strengthening of the United States is his his underlying uh, his underlying commitment. Did you um, did yeah. you want to you you you, yeah. you were saying about no you one? Wanted, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No one questioned the wisdom of his action. Um, so the the Americans heard that the Spanish were to retrocede their territory, the Louisiana territory, to France. Uh, Hamilton writes anonymously in a New York paper that um, there is absolutely no chance that Bonaparte will be willing to sell this territory, and there's there's no chance that Jefferson is going to take advantage of a deal if one becomes available. But already by this time, I believe it was Monroe who was over in France dealing with the French, uh, attempting to negotiate with them for this territory, and already by this time Jefferson had correspondence from. Well, Bonaparte was, in fact, willing to sell this territory and uh, to, not only to do so, but to do so at a bargain deal for the Americans. America was given this opportunity to double its size, to more than double its size with the, the signing of a pen and about what today would be about $15 million. Um, and not only that, but Louisiana was... Uh, it, this was a hub of trade, something like a, almost a half of all it went through the Louisiana, the, the at New Orleans. And so um, everybody wanted this. Everybody wanted for America to, to take the Louisiana territory. Uh, it was just a question of whether or not they could. And Jefferson alone had the scruples to say, well, we don't have the power. And, and everybody in his cabinet was telling him, well, yeah, you're right. If, we're, if we want to strictly interpret the Constitution, and so he wanted uh, he wanted to stall. He wanted to get an amendment to the Constitution before uh, purchasing Louisiana territory. And Monroe said, "You know what? If if you do that, if we give the the French the least opening here, this deal is going to fall through. So it's now or never." And it was just clear that it was in the best interests of the American people to uh, to own this territory, not to have a potentially hostile foreign power take it over. And, uh, and so um, he, in the end, decided that uh, it was worth going outside of what the enumerated powers granted him the, the ability to do to, to get this territory and then to sweep up the pieces later and to figure out how to, to legally justify this in future actions. That's my understanding what, of yeah. the, yeah. Right. I think that's well said, John. And it chokes me up. You know, here's why we love Thomas Jefferson. You know, he um, he did the right thing. It, 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 his his commitment to America is unquestioned. You know, he strengthened it uh, with the, with this vast uh, land, which turned out in many cases to be very fertile agricultural lands. It helped keep a potential you know uh, dangerous enemy. Uh, off of uh, 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 the American Western frontier and threatening shipping on the Mississippi. And he, he, and he was principled enough that, well, this goes against what, you know, the, the constitution, but uh, the constitution can be amended. We can, we, you know, we can, you know, we can add an amendment. He wanted, like you said, he wanted to add an amendment that would, that would enumerate that power for the, you know, for the U S government. Uh, so, so you see, you see him, him, Doing the doing the right thing here, and um, and then of course, uh, but by the way, uh, I mean Napoleon was involved in his wars in in Europe with Britain and and, and practically the whole European uh, practically the whole European continent. Uh, so he so he needed he needed the money. Nevertheless, I think Jefferson recognized France was a powerful nation. Napoleon is a is a military genius and a formidable enemy you don't want to have to have to fight i think uh, wellington had once uh the duke, duke of wellington had once said that that napoleon's presence was worth forty thousand french soldiers on the battlefield he was <laughs> he was that brilliant a military <laughs> a military strategist you don't want to have to go fight napoleon and this this is a we give him the money uh he, he's no threat now, but who knows what'll be in the future? Uh, he then that he won't be able to threaten you know uh, American navigation on the Mississippi. He won't have a powerful. The, the, we remove potentially a powerful enemy from the American frontier, and more than double uh, the the land of the United States with 
who, and who knows what kind of riches. And of course, there's a great deal of fertile agricultural land. But then he commissions the Lewis and Clark expedition to, to go uh, and explore. Go, go ahead, John. Well, one, there's just one more beautiful part of this story that I want to make sure that we get in here. The treaty sure. uh, to ratify the purchase arrives in America on July 3rd, 1803, oh, right, yeah. in time yeah. for the, the New York intelligencer to get out the news on July 4th, July 4th, 1803. So again, we have Jefferson connected to this date of July 4th, and it's just uh, you know one of these interesting moments in history. Yeah, this kind of stuff you can't make up, which will and we'll get we'll recur to this a little in a few minutes when we yeah. talk about the, the with with uh, coincidence with John Adams. But you can't make this stuff up. Uh, they say they say truth is stranger than fiction, and here it is. July fourth is a date that C. Thomas Jefferson is wed is just wedded to. But Lewis and Clark sent, sends them out to explore this. Vast territory, but parts of parts of which no Europeans, no no white man had ever you know was, had had ever uh, be, had ever been to or, or, or been in 1803 to 1806. And the interesting thing, the tidbit that, that I just discovered the other day when I when I was was reading this is you know, researching on this is that he personally tutored Meriwether Lewis in the sciences of mapping, botany, natural history, mineralogy uh astronomy and navigation and gave him unlimited access to his library at Monticello so that so that Lewis could be well versed in these various sciences and you know enable him to lead this expedition uh, effectively <laughs> so it's nice it's nice to have a yeah, yeah it is it's nice to have a brilliant polymath you know like Jefferson in in office and uh, tutoring his uh, his agents when they go out to explore when they ex explore this this vast territory so yeah, that I is uh, when it was uh i think at this time or even before this time he was uh elected one of the counselors and he, maybe even the president of the american philosophical association yes yeah I, yeah, I don't remember the timeline, but yeah, his his interest in philosophy and in the cognate disciplines. Yes, he was he was elected president of the American Philosophical Association amongst his other amongst his other accomplishments. So yeah, now we, yeah we discussed the Barbary we discussed the Barbary Wars um, last time, and and again it's it, to. to I think we can, you know, really honor Jefferson by con comparing and contrasting him with one of his uh, contemporaries, and that is Napoleon Bonaparte, because you know Napoleon was a genius. Everybody, everybody acknowledges it. Is it? Uh, I think it was Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, one of the greatest writers in the history of literature. You know, in, in, John, in literature, they they talk about the four greatest writers chronologically. It's it's always Homer, Dante, Shakespeare, Goethe. This Goethe is a monumental genius, and he regarded Napoleon as the greatest genius of history. Uh, period. Will Durant, you know, the immortal American historian, regarded Napoleon as the greatest genius of any of any man who was primarily a man of action, and he did a lot of good things, uh, you know, and you know, and overthrowing the ancient regime in a number of countries, bringing about religious freedom, even for the Jews, never mind for Catholics or Protestants in these countries, even the Jews, you know, uh, religious freedom. Uh, so Napoleon, and Napoleon did a lot of great things. And yet from an objectivist standpoint, John, he's a warmonger, he's an imperialist, his endless warfare, uh, wars of conquest, even though he's, he's promoting a freer country against these aristocracies. You know how many people were killed in these wars? I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands. You know, uh, so I can't regard Napoleon as a hero, although he has certain, you know, heroic elements. But Jefferson, Jefferson is not this bloodthirsty warmonger when he sends the U.S. Navy out against the Barbary pirates. Yes, and it was, if I remember correctly, I think it was the first time the U.S. Navy had crossed the Atlantic. You know, and then to do battle in the in the Med, it's to protect American shipping from from these Muslim corsairs who were satraps to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. You know, and the Mediterranean often referred to as an Ottoman lake. You know, and they preyed on you know the Muslims preyed on on Christian sh uh, Christian shipping. And Jefferson wasn't having it. He sent the navy out to you know in, in a war of defense. 
here against against the aggressors. And there's another reason why we love Thomas Jefferson. He was, not, you know, you could you could tell the United States was not a powerful nation at this point. It was a tiny country. But even if Jefferson were, were president, you know, at, at the height of American power, he would you, you would be your jaw would hit the floor if he used American power, you know, in in, in any ag aggressive war. You know, you could see he was he was going to build build up the navy or use the navy. He only in a, only in a war of self defense against the aggressors. Again, it's another reason why we. Uh, love Thomas Jefferson. I think I think it, it's we we emphasize we can emphasize it by contrasting them with with Napoleon, who was who had who had powerful elements of greatness, but the bloodthirsty, warmongering imperialism is just from an objectivist standpoint. You, I, I just can't sanction it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to compare Goethe's idea of the greatest man in history with Jefferson's. Jefferson thought that the right, three greatest right. men in history right. were, were Bacon, Locke, and Newton said that this, this was the Trinity. And, right. um, you know, you're, point. you're right. He, point. he, while he was minister Good. in, in France, he saw the, the other European courts, he, you know, he spoke with people. He, he learned that these other Europeans were simply paying tributes to the, the Tripolitan pirates, the Algerians and, the Moroccans, and uh, he thought that this was ridiculous and completely undignified. And he thought that there could be no, no nobler or more uh, uh, justified use of military strength than to uh, to to show these uh, the, these Muslim pirates who's boss. I mean, you know, we we saw. Uh, you know, we're, we see pirates today and, you know, this is America's response today. It's no different. If if you violate America's interests, if you violate the rights of Americans, the proper response, the proper response is a military response. And that's exactly what Jefferson wanted and, and right. spearheaded. And you know, it's, it's a number of interesting points you just you just raised, uh, John. One, the, the Trinity, you know, of, uh, of Bacon, Locke and Newton. These are intellectuals, and and they're and they're not warriors, you know. So I was surprised that Goethe would regard somebody who was primarily a warrior as the greatest hero or the greatest genius of, of history. Jefferson recognized, you know, long before Ayn Rand, it's the men of the mind, you know, his, the men of the mind who who carry us forward. These are the these are the real heroes, and so you know, kudos to Jefferson for you know for for realizing that, and two. They were British, <laughs> you know, the three of the fact they're all English. Uh, so Jefferson able to overcome his uh, animosity towards Great Britain to recognize the, 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 these three, these three giants, you know, uh, all, all, all of whom, by the way, I just realized we've, we've honored every one of those three on, on the hero show. We've done a show <laughs> on, on, on Newton, we've done a show on Locke, and we've done a show on Bacon, and you know, and and legitimately so. And so, you know, Jefferson, uh, whatever anti-British, uh, uh, you know, hostility he might have from the revolution, from the Revolutionary War, uh, he's able to overcome his prejudices to recognize that these three Brits as the uh, you know as the greatest heroes of history. And it goes with his commitment to the mind. You know, this is the man who swore, I love that quote, swore, uh, swear eternal hostility to every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Again, notice the wording here. He didn't, he didn't just say tyranny over man. He said tyranny over the mind of man. You know, recognizing, again, that this you know, long before Ayn Rand, 200 years before Ayn Rand, recognizing, you know, they, you know, without, you know, without Ayn Rand's insight that insight that this is mankind's survival in instrument, but recognizing that the the life and death importance of of, of the mind and the freedom of the mind, freedom of thinking, uh, freedom of thought in human life. This, this, this is why we love Thomas Jefferson, why we honor him, whatever his flaws are, and some of them are serious moral blemishes. But he is a giant in support of uh, individual liberties and, and, and freedom of thought, freedom of, of the human mind. He is, he's a giant, and anybody who denies it, I just tell him flat out, you're wrong, and we're going to cancel you for denying it. <laughs> Jefferson uh, was with a correspondent 
uh, in Britain, an, another another Brit, Joseph Priestley, who we's all, we've also done a show on. And yep. in retirement, Jefferson wanted nothing more than to establish a, a university in Virginia. And he wanted a place where he could teach, where the, the young could come and learn the principles of liberty, the principles of American government. And so he actually corresponded with Joseph Priestley and, and got uh, various bits of advice from Priestley on subjects and, and uh, professors and started building his, this idea of, of the University of Virginia. And ultimately, it came to fruition. The University of Virginia, uh, we can see it here if you're watching this on YouTube, a uh, beautiful statue of Jefferson in front of the, the dome the, uh, the dome-roofed main building here on, on campus. And not only did he design the curriculum and the, and the basic principles, but he designed the buildings too. He was the architect, primary architect for the University of Virginia. It's one of the most gorgeous uh, campuses in America. Yeah, I, it's my favorite. I, you know, for the Ayn Rand Institute, I've lectured all over the country. I don't know, like hundreds of different campuses around the country you know, over the last 25 years or so. And I got to say, UVA is my favorite campus. Obviously, Thomas Jefferson founded it and designed it. So that's a big part of it. But it's a beautiful campus. It's everything a campus, a, a, a university should look like with the with the green quad and you know the the stately the stately architecture it's, it's what a campus should look like and so you get thomas jefferson in support of freedom of the mind uh founded the university of virginia one of like you said last week john one of the three achievements he wanted as an epitaph on his tombstone uh mm -hmm. donated his uh per, his massive uh, collection of books to to aid and support the library of congress I mean, you see, you see Jefferson uh, supporting uh, supporting intellectual development in in every possible way, and we we would be remiss, I think, John, if we didn't close out the show with uh, the reestablishment of friendly relations with the great John Adams, who who deserves a hero show and who will get one when we can schedule mm -hmm. the great John Adams scholar. Uh, Bradley Thompson to come on and prove. He, I think he used the word prove, didn't he? He was going to prove he did. that. that yeah, all right. Well, this is coming from Brad Thompson. So, I mean, this is not just an idle boast. Uh, he's an expert, world class expert. So, you know, to prove that John Adams was the most important of the founders, which would be a fascinating uh, discussion. But uh, what Adams left DC after the contentious uh, election, uh, you know, of 1800. Uh, and, and Jefferson, of course, as we discussed, as was uh, had stabbed him in the back while he was president. Went back to Massachusetts. I don't think he ever. I don't think he ever returned to D.C. Uh, in, in, in the 26 years that that, that he lived. And um, Jefferson, of course, uh, they 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 were not friends during during the, this this period. Adams had reason to hold a grudge against Thomas Jefferson. But after after Jefferson left, I think it was after he left the White House. Um, that that they were they rekindled you know this get this again chokes me up these two great men they rekindled their relationship and I think we'll ask we'll ask Brad Thompson this I think I'm not sure because like I said I'm no expert on, on American history I think it was John Adams who you know who took the steps to re, to rekindle it uh, you, you know and, and Adams may have been the bigger man on on this issue reaching out forgiving Jefferson for what he you know stabbing him in the back recognizing. The great values that Jefferson embodied, wanting Jefferson, you know, in his life again, reached out. I think it was Adams who reached out to Jefferson. I think Jefferson was very happy, you know, to 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 hear from from Adams, and and they and they held a correspondence, uh, you know, until 1826. <laughs> we'll get to it. Just a minute. Their correspondence back and forth because they never met. They never met in person again. This was not. This this was you know 18. 15, 18, 20, you can't just hop on the, you know, you, you can't just hop on the Metro liner and go back and back and forth or the, you know, the Delta shuttle up to Boston to visit your good buddy, John Adams, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> traveling was, was, traveling was difficult, but their correspondence is, is a gold mine of, of uh, philosophic thinking between these two great, these two great minds. And I, and I think historians have spent a lot of time, you know, researching the, the, the Jefferson Adams correspondence. 
Yeah, this has to be one of the most beautiful sets of letters in American history between two former presidents, two friends that had a falling out and then rekindled their relationship. Here, you know, uh, older, uh, you know, uh, seniors essentially at this point, but um, they have deep interests and they're, they're both still very much men of the mind and they discuss all sorts of different subjects, religion, philosophy, as you said, and just uh, even sometimes politics. And they just have this very interesting back and forth that goes on for years. And, and Jefferson's updating Adams and telling him about the uh, progress on his university. And it's the thing he's most proud of. And it's just a, a, it's just a, a gold mine of, of historic uh, conversation between these two great minds. Right. And again, I find it very touching. You know, I, I start to cry that these two great men were able to, you know, to bury the hatchet, as it were, clear the air, rekindle the, uh, the close relationship that they'd had, the revolutionary relationship. These guys forged the American Revolution you know, with a little help from their friends. But, you know, Adams and Jefferson <laughs> were in the forefront and they were in the forefront of forging the American Revolution. These are historic players acting on the world stage. Great men. And yeah, Jefferson did him dirt. And Adams was a big man and he, you know, and, and he forgave him. And they rekindled. And, you know, the, the intellectual content of the correspondence is brilliant and fascinating. But I'm just happy for them as, as men, as persons, that they had each other in their lives. They had each other back. The friendship is important. You know, you, you know we're not just disembodied minds. We're integrated persons and we want love and we want friendship and we want you know close human intimacy and i'm, I'm very happy for both of them they deserved it you know that they had this yeah. relationship again they had this relationship again <clears throat> at the end of their lives and john adams lost his wife his beloved wife abigail who died before him jefferson of course had been a you know a widow for, for many years his beloved wife martha had died you know a long time before that so you know, it's like I'm like like uh, Hank Reed and Francisco Danconia and Atlas Shrugged. They had this <laughs> they developed this great personal relation. I'm glad for both of them. These two great men, they deserve this. And they had a little side bet going, didn't they, as to who would who would die first, <laughs> who would outlive <laughs> who would outlive the other? Adams Adams was older than Jefferson by well, how many years? Seven or eight years, I I think. Uh, so what actually happened is just astounding. I, I mean, again, you can't make this stuff up, John, right? I mean, they no both- No fiction died. writer could, could have come up with a better ending to this story. Yeah. That's right. I mean, I've published two novels. If I had written this in a novel, people would look at me and they would have said, Andy, this is, Andy, this is unrealistic. You've got to cut this. This is just, this is just, this is just <laughs> it's too unbelievable. But they, they, they not only died on the same day, but the day happens to be July 4th, 1826, 50 years to the day you know, of, the, of the Declaration of Independence, and, which is just unbelievable. And I think, you know, so one of the last, some of the last words that John Adams spoke was Thomas Jefferson still lives, not realizing that down in Virginia that they, they, they couldn't get on the their cell phones, you know, and say and say goodbye. That down in Virginia, Thomas Jefferson was on his deathbed and died died later. He died the same day. I think it was later that day. So if they had a if they had a bet going, who would outlive the other? Jefferson won by I, by a few hours, I, I I think. But you know, Jefferson was what eighty three or eighty four when he died, and Adams was like ninety or ninety one when they when you know when, when he died. But to die on the same day is you, again, it, it would be unrealistic if you wrote it in a novel. But that that day happened to be July fourth, eighteen twenty six, the fiftieth anniversary to the day of the Declaration of Independence. That, that is just that is just beyond belief. It's absolutely it's absolutely beyond belief. But it's real. It's history. Yeah, one of the most beautiful moments in American history. One of these things that we can look on in awe and, uh, and just appreciate both these men as the. Atlases of Independence. This is the, the phrase given to John Adams for his work in the uh, in the early conventions. And uh, but but both of them, both of them, I think, uh, deserve this this moniker to some extent. They, they were both atlases of independence. They kindled this beautiful friendship, and 
and you know their closing days enjoyed so many uh, close letters and and uh, correspondence over their shared beliefs and ideas and hopes for the future of the country. And 50 years to the day after the 4th of July, after the Declaration of Independence, they shuffle off the world call and leave us with this tremendous. So it's like it's like reality had written a script here and couldn't resist you know, this, this is, you know, if reality is writing a script, it writes some ugly stuff into the story. <laughs> you know, all the mass murders and the slavery and the dictators and everything. But it's like, it's like reality thought if, if I can, you know, personalize or anthropomorphize rea metaphysical reality. It's like, this is such a, a monumental achievement, the establishment of the freest country in history. And these two men were such giants. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the story on this perfect moment. And, you know, and, uh, and he did. And that's a great way to end our tribute to uh, one of the America's immortals, one of the world's immortals, Thomas Jefferson. And uh, it's a nice segue into a future show on the great John Adams. Absolutely. All right. Well, well I've got one parting thought here, one quote to share with, with people. Um, this, by the way, is the very beginning of Noble Cunningham's biography of Thomas Jefferson in pursuit of Clifton, which is a great single volume biography. Nice but, uh, first name rests, for a bio nice first name, isn't it? For bio no, biography Noble of Thomas Cunningham. Jefferson. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. It's uh, one of these excellent names for a, a Thomas Jefferson biographer. It rests now with ourselves alone to enjoy in peace and concord the blessings of self government so long denied to mankind, to show by example the sufficiency of human reason for the care of human affairs, and that the will of the majority, the natural law of every society, is the only sure guardian of the rights of man. Well said. Well said. Well, on that note, John, I think we should salute the great Thomas Jefferson, and I'm going to wish you have a a heroic day. Everybody out there in Hero Land, have a her more heroic day and a heroic weekend. And we'll see you next week on the Hero Show, everybody.